This is Mike's talk, and so he should get all the credit for it, and I should take any blame for anything that's unclear. Um, and please don't ask me about the flow plots themselves, because that's not my line of work. I'm pretty good at knowing how to use the data, but I certainly don't know how to generate it. So really, um, this, this is going to focus on how we measure uh, MRD in the Children's Oncology Group, which is by flow cytometry. Um, and as we've mentioned this morning, there are a number of prognostic factors in childhood ALL, and early response to therapy is among, if not the single strongest, most important prognostic factor. And this, this can be measured several ways. If you go back, you know, one of, one of the ways which is still used widely throughout the world is the BFM prednisone response. So when BFM therapy uh, was first developed in the 1960s, they didn't have the prednisone prephase or prophase. And that was really added in the 1970s, I think in the BFM 76 trial, if I remember correctly, to really allow them to stabilize the patient. It was really, let's give them just some prednisone for a week that allow us to stabilize the patient, get them healthier. And what turned out was the response to that one week of corticosteroids was highly predictive of outcome, as you see here. So we see you know, about 90% of patients are prednisone good responders, without going into all the details. So they have a good response after a month, and about 10% or, or a week of prednisone in a single dose of intrathecal methotrexate, and about 10% are poor responders. And in this older slide, slide you see a 50 percentage point difference in event-free survival for prednisone good versus prednisone bad responders. And however, 72, because this group has 90% of the patients, 72% of the events happen in the good responder group. So prednisone poor response is an important prognostic factor, but if you just rely on that, you're missing almost three quarters of the events that will happen. Uh, the Children's Cancer Group originally relied on uh, the, pre the uh, response in the bone marrow after either seven or 14 days of multi-agent chemotherapy, and that was highly predictive of outcome. And this is just one of many studies that just looks as to when patients got to less than 5% blasts in the marrow. If you got there after seven days, you did better. If you got there after 14 days, and you did much better than those who took 28 days to get there. So response to either monotherapy or combination therapy is highly predictive of outcome. And I think this is very important because you have to remember, even if you look at response to induction therapy, there are, that's three or four drugs out of a total of about 10 or 12 that are given. So it's not assessing your response to cyclophosphamide, ERC, methotrexate, but it holds true. So it's, it's probably detecting an intrinsic chemotherapy sensitivity of the leukemia cells. So really the, the uh, hypothesis, and I don't think it is hard to believe this now, but it was that MRD would be, as a more sensitive marker of response, would be a better, better predictor of outcome. And you can ma measure MRD by a number of ways. In the Children's Oncology Group, we have decided to use flow cytometry. The question often comes up, uh, when done correctly, flow cytometry and IGTCR, PCR, using standard methodologies, are extremely concordant at levels above 10 to the minus 4. Uh, it is true that molecular methodologies can detect disease better and quantitate it better below 10 to the minus 4. The clinical significance of that is less clear, but they're, they're quite concordant in terms of results. And this is based on the fact that leukemia cells have phenotypes that can be readily distinguished from normal cells. And it's typically due to expression of antigens at inappropriate times during the B cell development or inappropriate intensities compared to what normal B cell maturation should be. And so this slide I will not take any questions on. <laughs> But the, these are standard flow plots of normal B cell maturation. And here, Mike has generously color coded them for me. So the leukemia cells are in the orange, the normal cells are in the blue. And you can see that you can clearly distinguish, particularly with some antigen combinations, the leukemia cells from the normal cells. So that really allows you to focus on where the abnormal cells should be.
And so, at least within the COG, there's really three generations of MRD testing that we can think of. So the first generation was the Pediatric Oncology Group, or POG 9900 series studies. So these were an attempt to see if you could do flow cytometry, detection of MRD in a centralized lab in real time, and believe the data. So the way this was done is that the samples were sent at day 29 in bone marrow and day 8 in peripheral blood to a central lab, Mike Borowitz's lab at Johns Hopkins. The samples were run in real time, but the results were not conveyed to the treating physicians and no action was made based on those results because this was really intended to be a proof of principle because there was some uh, realistic debate over whether this would really be feasible in this setting. And so this enrolled several thousand patients, and I think a couple important points is that informative MRD results were available within 24 to 48 hours in over 98% of patients who sent samples, or for whom samples were sent. So this can be done, it can be done in real time, and it can be done in almost all patients, which does differentiate it from some of the immunoglobulin or T-cell receptor, particularly the older methodologies. And so, you know, this was the end result of this study. As you can see, roughly 2,000 patients enrolled. And you see a stepwise gradation with the patients who have MRD less than 0.1%, doing better than less than 0.1%, doing better than 1%, doing better than 10%. So a stepwise gradation in predicting outcome. However, still half of the events happened in this group because somewhere around 75 to 80 percent of patients are MRD negative at this level. And we're going to, we'll come back, but when we first decided to act on MRD in, in the clinical trials, these data were not available to us at that time, the correlation with outcome. So we decided to use this as the MRD cutoff less than 0.1% to define bad actors. And we subsequently realized that was not the right cutoff and that this is a better cutoff. And when you looked at multivariate analysis, you can see that the day 29 minimal residual disease was highly significant, the most significant of any of the risk factors. And the important thing is that day eight marrow morphology was no longer statistically significant when MRD was controlled for. And this is really the result that led us to abandon testing day eight and day 15 marrow morphology during induction. And this, you know, when you submit a paper, you often get asked questions by reviewers, and 99% of the time, the questions irritate you. You think, why do I have to do that? That's a dumb question, I don't wanna do that. But when this paper was submitted for review, we were asked a question, we said, wow, that's a really good question, we never thought of that. And the question was, does minimal residual disease predict only early relapse, or does it also predict late relapse? And so we ran these analyses, and I think, you know, frankly, we're astonished by the results. So this one is not surprising. This looks at patients who relapse within three years of therapy. So if you look, these are the patients who are MRD negative with a 0.01% cutoff at the end of induction, and these have more than that level of MRD. So not at all surprising. Patients with MRD at end induction have a much higher risk of relapse. But this slide is what was surprising. So now we took all the patients who are in remission at three years, so anybody who is still in remission at three years, and asked what, what was their outcome after three years, starting the clock over at three years, based on end induction minimal residual disease. And MRD was just as predictive, if not more so, of later relapse happening. So this was actually a great question from a reviewer. If any of you reviewed that, we thank you. And uh, really a, a result that very much surprised us because we didn't expect that. And we also looked at day eight peripheral blood in this study. So here, again, we're looking at minimal residual disease levels in day eight peripheral blood. And again, there's a, a marching of outcome based on the MRD with the more MRD you have, the worse you do. And here, an important event is if you look at the patients who in peripheral blood have less than 0.01% MRD at day eight, they have an extremely good outcome, and only 16% of events happened in this group. So this helps us tell you can use minimal residual disease testing for two things. One is to identify bad actors, and the other is to identify good actors. 
you want to identify good actors, this is particularly useful because it starts to hone in on the patients who are going to have very few events. And when you look, at least in this trial, if you look just among the patients who had day, eight, day 29 marrow less than 0.01%, the day 8 peripheral blood discriminated good versus poor outcome. So these are all patients who are MRD less than 0.01% at end induction, and just a question of whether they're below or above 1% at day 8 of induction. And then this is the same analysis, just confined to patients with NCI high-risk ALL, showing that even among the patients who are MRD negative at end <coughs> induction at that cutoff, if you had greater than 1% at day 8, you had a not, a not very good outcome at all. And so then with these data, again, we, when we designed the first set of children's oncology group studies, we did not have those data available. What we knew is you could measure MRD very accurately with rapid turnaround. That part worked, but we didn't know how it correlated with outcomes. So we actually had a pretty vigorous debate and finally decided, well, we just need to act on this. We, we don't know the results, but they should, based on small studies that had been published on the time, they should be accurate, and we're going to act on the results. So a couple things happened. One, the original studies were done with a four-color method, so they switched to a six-color method. Uh, because the children's oncology group had twice the volume of patients, we thought we needed a second laboratory, so we had a, a uh, we sent out an RFA and we reviewed a number of applications, and Brent Wood uh, was selected as being the best second lab to add, so now we had two labs, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. Mignon Lowe was in the audience. She was the co-chair of this study with Elizabeth Rates, and that was part of the coordination was if you're on east of the Mississippi, you send it to Hopkins, and west of the Mississippi, you send it to uh, Seattle. And in fact, if you look at the number of pediatric ALL cases, the Mississippi kind of cuts the U.S. in half numerically in terms of cases quite well. And we decided to act on results, but we chose a higher day one, a day 29 MRD cutoff because we wanted to choose something that we thought was high enough to definitely be predictive of poor outcome. So. Patients who had day 29 MRD greater than 0.1% or we were still using the bone marrow morphology or a morphologic poor response received intensified therapy. And this just looks at, um, this is the methods of the six color flow, which I won't go into. And this just correlates between four and six color flow, showing that they are extremely well correlated. Six color flow gives you the ability to measure more patients and to be able to de detect lower levels than four color flow. And this is just a, a depiction again, it's color coded. So normal cells uh, or orange cells are the leukemia cells at diagnosis, blue are the normal B cell precursors and deep blue are MRD. And you can see, you know, here's a good example. Here's a patient with 0.04% MRD and you can see how well distinguished this is from the normal B cell precursors in a number of places. Others, it's a little more challenging with different antigen combinations, but some of them it's very clear. Here's another combination that's very good. <clears throat> and one of the things with two labs, we didn't, we didn't do paired samples. So we didn't have samples sent both to the uh, West and East Coast labs, but we did say, well, we've, we're testing a lot of patients, so this is based on when we did this analysis, 2,500 patients, if we're detecting the same thing in both places, you should have pretty similar uh, percentages of patients at different MRD levels. And as you see, they're quite, they're quite analogous. And this looks at the correlation between the east and west flow cytometries in terms of percentage. And you don't get many R squared values of 0.98. So really, we feel that these labs are measuring the same things, and they're very good. They actually, you know, talk about cases that are right on the margin of intervention. If there's any questions, they'll exchange flow plots and, and look at them together. And so this looks, now this is the study uh, that's been mentioned several times. It's our NCI high-risk trial that uh, Eric Larson chaired, AALL0232. And this looks at the outcome of event, uh, event-free survival based on the day 29 minimal residual disease. And there's, 
two important things about this slide. The first is you, as before, when you look out here, you see a marching, you see a marching of outcomes. The more MRD you had, the worse you did. But very interestingly, we see this crossover. So on this study, patients who had greater than 0.1% MRD had their treatment intensified. So this yellow line patients got intensified treatment compared to the patients in this curve. So what you see is initially the intensified treatment delayed relapse in these patients, but eventually it didn't do any good. But if you look, that's at about three years, so it seems to have pushed relapses to happening off therapy with intensified treatment. And here, <coughs> again, comparing the two labs, uh, again, this MAC-PC translation problem, um, we see that the two labs had identical predictive <coughs> values. So this simply looks at the predictive value of different MRD cutoffs in the two different East and West Coast laboratories. And this is on our standard risk trial. So AALL00331 was a standard risk trial chaired by Kelly Maloney. And again, we see this marching order of outcomes, although we see a lot less difference between the patients who are between 0.01% and 0.1% and those between 0.1% and 1%. Whereas clearly those above 1% do much worse and those above 10%, very few of them do much worse. And you don't see the same inflection point that you saw. You didn't see that crossover that we saw in the high-risk study. So one of the questions, and so on these trials, we use both minimal residual disease and um, bone marrow morphology to select patients for treatment intensification. So really there were four groups of patients. They're the ones who are negative by both, the ones who are positive by both, and the ones who are negative by one and positive by the other, or positive by one and negative by the other. And the interesting thing you see here is we, if we look at the patients who were positive by MRD, so either MRD in the blue line, MRD and morphology, or the red line, MRD alone, they have a poor outcome and it's identical. But if you look at the patients who are poor responders by morphology and good responders by MRD, they look no different than the MRD negative patients. So this really was a good part of the argument we used to tell us that we no longer needed to test bone mar marrow morphology. And one of the things, so if you remember when we talked the start, I said we use this 0.1% cutoff rather than, than what we now feel is a better cutoff of 0.01%. So we had patients who had higher levels of MRD who got their treatment intensified. And when you look, you see the ones that are, sorry, let me explain that better. So some of the, nobody had their treatment intensified based on MRD because all these patients were less than 0.1%. So we looked at the patients who are between 0.1 and 0.01, but some of them were rapid responders by morphology and didn't get their treatment intensified, and some were slow responders by morphology and got their treatment intensified, and the one whose treatment was intensified did significantly better than those whose treatment was not intensified. So this really is a strong argument the intensification of therapy based on MRD will improve outcome. Uh, the UK group has recently published a very nice paper in Lancet Oncology with a, a randomized comparison, but also showing that intervening in MRD positive patients with intensified standard chemotherapy improves outcome. So that takes us to our third generation of studies. This is our current classification study, AAL08B1. And Patrick Swedler McKay, who's somewhere out there, it co chairs that with Karen Rabin. And so now we're taking patients with day 29 MRD greater than 0.01% intensifying therapy. We're using day 8 MRD in risk stratification, and we've identified a so called best of the best or an ultra low risk group who are patients who have NCI standard risk features, favorable genetics, and are day 8 peripheral blood and day 29 bone marrow MRD negative. These patients had a 97% five-year EFS on one of our older studies, and we're randomizing them between two different low-intensity regimens, 
not to compare the regimens, but simply to say, does both of them, do both of them achieve an EFS greater than 95%? If so, then it could kind of be dealer's choice how you treated them. And patients who are NCI standard risk, who have day eight minimal residual disease greater than 1%, receive post-induction intensification of therapy independent of their day 29 MRT. And as I mentioned, we've dropped day eight and 15 bone marrow morphology. So several conclusions from this is the first um, is that minimal residual disease can be measured in large-scale clinical trials. Uh, we have now used MRD to allocate treatment in over 13,000 patients since 2003. So we're doing this every day, you know, 2,000 patients a year. This can be done. It can be done well. Almost everybody has informative data, and we can... We can use this to monitor to uh, modify <laughs> therapy. Uh, MRD is prognostically significant in every ALL trial in which it's been looked at, but the timing of measurement, the appropriate threshold for intervention could be protocol specific. MRD is the most powerful but not the only prognostic factor in childhood ALL, and it's possible to get extremely good agreement between two different laboratories run by two of the small handful of world leaders in flow cytometry interpretation, which would be Mike and Brent. <clears throat> we have intensification of therapy may improve the outcome of some MRD positive patients, but still higher levels of MRD are correlated with poor outcome. So some of the issues we have with MRD testing is that many, if not most of us now in pediatric ALL, consider MRD testing to be a standard of care. So is there any pediatric oncologist in this room who has a patient who's, who's not enrolled in a clinical trial who does not perform MRD testing on that patient? Yeah, I don't think so. I'm not aware of anyone who does not use MRD to modulate treatment intensity independent of clinical trial participation, which is good, but the NCI, particularly in wanting to co cut costs, has came to us a while ago and said, well, this is a standard of care test. You guys use it whether or not someone's enrolled in a clinical trial, so we shouldn't be paying for it from the NCI budget. You should be paying, the patient should be charged a fee for service uh, charge for it, just like if you got a PET scan for someone with a lymphoma, you'd say that's a standard of care. We're going to charge it to the patient. We're not going to, we're not going to expect the NCI to uh, pay for it. And, and I agree with them completely. But the issue with this is how you, how you prove that labs can do it and can do it well. Because the FDA requires that laboratory tests being used to change therapy on a clinical trial either need to be FDA approved, and flow testing of MRD is not FDA approved, or you need to demonstrate that you can yield equivalent results in different laboratories. Now, we see these, we get these calls all the time from patients or emails from people treating patients. You know, my local laboratory did MRD testing and got 12%, and your central lab did MRD testing and got 0.1%. What's going on there? And in some cases, it may be samples. You know, we always encourage people to send the first sample, for, for first pull of a marrow for MRD testing. But in many cases, it's that the local labs don't know how to measure MRD in, in, from very well-known, very reputable centers. Um, so right now, flow cytometry-based MRD is performed in COG centers in North America is really not validated outside of the University of Washington or Hopkins uh, Hopkins centers. So after a lot of back and forth with the NCI, we said we're perfectly happy to do this, but we need some period of time to phase it in. They agreed and, and, and generously provided a good deal of money to support the ongoing centralized MRD testing for a period of two years, provided that we develop a plan to decentralized MRD testing. And so we're, do, we're doing that now, it's a, and the two-year clock started uh, a few months ago. So we continue to perform centralized flow cytometry-based MRD detection for patients enrolled in our clinical trials. Uh, the, and those tests have to be sent to either Hopkins or 
or um, University of Washington, depending on which side of the Mississippi you're on, and the patients are not charged. But in parallel now, we are starting a process to certify or gain approval of local laboratories. So basically a local lab that wants to become approved has to do testing on their own in parallel to the COG center sites, and they have to use the same methodologies and demonstrate that there's concordance between the results. And that process has started. I will tell you, having seen some of the original data, you see some laboratories that are right on from the start. They're extremely concordant. Things look perfect. And you see some other laboratories, again, from very reputable big name centers who are way off, one to two orders of magnitude off in MRD levels. So I think this is not a simple procedure. Andrea Biondi and I were talking about this at lunchtime. In Europe, they've gone through a lot of efforts already to standardize flow-based MRD testing, and that's what we're doing now. So I think once these labs learn, it's not, it's not rocket science, frankly. It, it's, it's something that people can learn how to do, but until then, you know, I would not trust a local laboratory flow-based MRD test because I just don't, I've just seen too much variability. Um, so after two years, there'll be a set of labs that will be approved. We expect it'll be a couple dozen probably will gain approval. And then we will require that anyone enrolled in a COG trial send MRD testing on a fee-for-service basis to one of the approved labs. If they like Hopkins or University of Washington, they can keep doing it. If they're, they can keep sending it there on a fee-for-service basis. If their own center is approved, they can do it there. There are some commercial companies that are going to be certified, uh, but they'll have to send it somewhere, and the patient's insurance uh, will need to pay for it, which is really entirely appropriate. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to stop there, and these, these are uh, Mike's uh, acknowledgments of all the people involved, but I do think, you know, particularly the key people, uh, Minnie Davis, our statistician with the COG, uh, Brent, Brent's lab, and Mike and Mike's lab really are the key people in, in this uh, exercise. Thank you very much. Thank you.